Y'all know how this goes. Without any further ado, let's cue the music and start that word chat. everybody welcome to that word chat so happy to have you back again uh today we have we, we've been wanting to get a librarian we've always so we should really have a librarian as word chats we haven't had a librarian on yet as far as i can remember uh today we finally have a librarian so uh we have megan rosenblum uh who has who has written uh a very interesting book from a librarian's perspective Dark Archives, a librarian's investigation into the science and history of books bound in human skin. So a little bit of a good uh, topic for October as things get chilly and Halloween approaches. Uh, so um, I should say that uh, uh, Megan is a collection strategies librarian at UCLA, UCLA Library in Los Angeles. She has served as a medical librarian for years, and that's where she developed an interest in this. Um, so welcome to the show. Glad to have you here. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, so the the I, I figured I so I had some you know preconceived notions of somebody who's fascinated by this topic um, as somebody maybe you know who has maybe a little bit of a uh it is sort of drawn to the to the topic but then i, I read in the book it, it's interesting you, you talk about your first introduction to the idea of binding a book um in not cow's leather but human skin um and you were a bit you're a bit shocked and horrified <laughs> uh, can you tell us a little bit about how this all came about Sure. Yeah, I was um, I'm from Philadelphia area and I was in, um, you know, I was in library school, but it was one of those early times uh, you have to have a master's to be a librarian. So I was working and getting my master's and it was one of those early programs that was mostly online. Uh, and so I was interested in rare books, but I couldn't, my program didn't have an online component for that. So I was trying to do internships and, and visit places to kind of be near rare books and things because that was an interest. And uh, I started noticing them a lot more than I did before, right? Where if you're in a museum, a lot of times people are looking at art and artifacts and the books on display, they might just walk right by them, right? And right. I was, really kind of noticing that more specifically for the first time, I think. Um, and I was at the Mütter Museum, which is a very distracting museum for that kind of thing, because there are, you know, a colon the size of a small car next to, you know, a lot of dead bodies. There's a, this is a <laughs> what is this museum, the Mütter? The Mütter Museum in Philadelphia is a, a medical pathology museum. So it was I've initially heard of this. for teaching doctors in the 19th century, which is actually the same time that the human skin books happened around this time. So, but I didn't know any of this because I didn't know about history of medicine that much in more than a casual way. Uh, but that time period, you know, doctors were doing a lot of, you know, dissection and learning through dissection really on a big scale for the first time and and also doing a lot of collecting of you know body parts unusual body parts to show hey this is what this unusual disease looks like because you might not see it at the bedside right, right. so this was like the the idea of the moon museum is basically that you know collecting these different medical specimens so that 
physicians could see them and recognize them if they come across them in patients and things like that. So you're in this beautiful 19th century room full of dead bodies. And so the books are not really going to be the thing that jump out at you <laughs> so much, right? Um, so I had been there many times before, but I never really noticed it. And uh, there's this sort of, it's like two floors and a sort of open atrium. And around the atrium level, there were these glass cases with some very boring looking books with their covers closed and I'm thinking why is why are they showing this with its cover closed it doesn't look like it. it's just a brown leather bleh, you know like nothing um and then I read the little caption next to it that said it was uh that they were books bound in human skin and that they were made by doctors and that I was just completely blown away at these innocent looking boring looking books that had this deeply macabre backstory and they truly look like any book you would any normal book you would see on a shelf and so you really wouldn't pick them out it's sort of like that cognitive dissonance of you know the serial killer next door kind of thing <laughs> like oh you know they asked the neighbors oh he was quiet he kept to himself you know he just looks like a normal guy <laughs> But he has this dark secret. And that sort of that sort of frisson, you know, uh, was really what kind of blew my mind. And and I thought, like many other things, oh, this is a Mütter thing, right? This is only here. Um, you know, the Mütter has Chang and Ang bunkers conjoin liver and it's only there, right? And so I just assume <laughs> that certain things are only there. But then as I continued my you know study and travel and stuff I would ask um and then I kept hearing oh yeah I think we have one of those or I think we have a couple <laughs> whatever and I'm like why do why do these libraries just have these things you know yeah. and in a very kind of casual way um museums are used to reckoning with having human remains of some kind right uh but libraries not so much um and so I got really interested and I just happened to get interested at the same time that Harvard had employed someone to do some scientific testing on their three alleged human skin books at that time. And so I happened to be coming through and interviewed him and talked about it. And then we started comparing notes, kind of like, oh, did you hear about this one? Oh, I just tested these. And then we sort of joined forces and then added a few more people to the team and decided we would try to test as many as we could. Um, and and this is this this is the anthropo anthropodermic, anthro human podermic skin uh, book project. Yes, uh, anthropodermic, anthro human dermic skin. Anthropo is human and dermic. Right. Skin. Yeah. Okay. Um, and funny for the word thing, I was starting to research this and I said the second part of that phrase wrong for an embarrassingly long time. So I will never make fun of anyone for not getting it right. <laughs> um, well, it's, the, it's Greek, you know. Yeah, the bibliophagy. I used to say bibliopegy. Oh. Um, but bibliopagy is bi biblio book. Pudgy is uh to fasten or to bind so humans bind. book binding okay so uh it so that so that this is did this immediately come about this anthro anthropodermic book project where you said to the guy from harvard hey let's form a club <laughs> Um, no, it was really, I wish we had some sort of Avengers, you know, uh, superhero <laughs> origin story. It'd be a lot easier <laughs> to tell. But it just kind of um, sometimes, especially in, I don't know, academia or library land, you uh, you start, you, you get interested in something and you keep tabs on it and then it starts to snowball. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and then it becomes, oh, now I have a project or now I have a thing or this should be a book. Um, and right. that sort of it, it was a slower kind of process. And we were not uh, we're not grant funded. We did, you know, it wasn't like we were getting paid to do this. It was really just uh, academic curiosity. And I love interdisciplinary kind of research where it's history and it's 
librarianship and its material culture and its chemistry, you know, mm -hmm. it was all these things. Yeah, how, how do you test to see if a book is human or human origin? So the test itself is a very, luckily, cheap <laughs> and well-established kind of method uh, in proteomics, <laughs> which is, you know, the study of proteins, right? So everyone always asks about DNA um, because it's funny. I watched that uh, that sort of um, TV show about the O.J. Simpson trial, um, and they were trying, they were desperately trying to explain to jurors about DNA and why they should like trust it as a thing. And then you fast forward to now, and people assume that DNA is the tool for everything, and that it does everything, and it's available in every way. And it's not true, right? So DNA is really good for like freshly dead things. Um, and these books are hundreds of years old. Yeah. And they are also, they have been through a very, you know, intense chemical process to go from raw skin to leather. And so there may be D some DNA in there, but it's probably mostly destroyed, right? And you can get false positives of DNA of human touch from handling, right? So, so DNA doesn't work for, for this particular endeavor, but what lasts a lot longer than your DNA is your proteins like collagen in skin. And you can't get as specific about what, or at least at current, you know, time, you can't get as specific about what the protein tells you, but you can tell from different kind of animal families based off of what protein markers exist. And lucky for us, the kind of hooved animals um, are all able to be distinguished from one another because they have one different protein marker from each other. So you can tell a sheep from a pig, from a cow, from a goat. And those are the main animals that we use for bookbinding, right? But uh, if you get a great ape in there, <laughs> that is a big, <laughs> a big tell, right? So no, we can't tell where people are from. We can't tell their biological sex. We can't tell a lot of things, but what we absolutely can tell is that it is either a human or uh, some sort of large primate, like a monkey or a you know, gorilla or something. And given the rest of the bibliographic historical context, the likelihood of it being a gorilla is somewhat right. low. Right. Um, so it's the, te the test is called, um, um, Wow, did I just uh, peptide mass fingerprinting? <laughs> PMF Pe peptide uh, yes. mass fingerprinting. So the okay. fingerprint that you get, <laughs> it ends up you put a teeny, teeny, tiny little thing in a vial and you digest it in this little enzyme, and then you put it through a little desktop machine kind of thing, and then it spits out what looks like a, a line graph, and then you match the line graph to a library of known animals, and then it's like that is a sheep. That's usually how it goes. Oh, right. So how many how many books has the project tested? So our project, we've done a we our project was like set with one kind of parameter, but then we've also tested outside of the parameters. So the per, the initial goal there was let's identify as many alleged books found in human skin in public collections as possible. So libraries, museums, whatever, and then test them. So of those, we've identified about 50 alleged and we tested 31 of those and 18 were human and the rest were not. Uh, but we've also done a lot of testing of individual collectors come to us and ask for you know their private um, collections. Uh, we've tested non um, book objects. Uh, and, oh, and like, for example, oh, let's see, what did we it's test? It's going to get oh. even more gruesome. Um, you know, I'm, I'm looking, uh, you know, so the hum the Mütter Museum had things like an alleged wallet. Uh. 
that was actually turned out not to be human. But you get uh, some things like that, or there's um, near me at the Huntington Library, they had a note on an alleged like human skin kind of parchment looking thing. So it's not actually a bound book, but it was like written on things that says, I wrote this on hu human skin and it was not human skin. Um, so that kind of thing. Uh, we also tested a, uh, an alleged, and this is something that comes up a lot, uh, an alleged like Nazi era lampshade. Um, so people, when they hear human skin objects, they immediately go Nazis, but the, the human, we have not tested anything yet from that era that has been human. Um, and, but people have a lot of reasonable associations there, but we haven't actually encountered any of those to be real. But what I think happens is there were stories about, and I get very detailed about this in one chapter in the book, and because it was something I wanted to make sure I did justice by. Um, but there's basically, uh, you know, that's people's first association. And there were, there were, you know, rumors about human skin books and, in, I mean, human skin lampshades, and in particular, one particular lampshade that existed. Um, and then people thought that it was something that was being routinely made. Uh, and then they will see an example of a lampshade and it looks creepy. And so a lot of people think this looks creepy, including with books, this looks creepy. Maybe it's human skin, but it's not. So there was even a whole book uh, about like a guy finding a, you know, a lampshade in post Katrina, New Orleans and getting it te DNA tested. And in the book, it said that it was tested positive, but then they retested it for a, t for a documentary TV show. And it turns out that it wasn't, it was like that human trace problem. Oh, wow. Uh, so if you read, read the copy of the book, then you're gonna think that they found this thing and you didn't, which uh, is a nightmare for, for that research. I feel really bad. You know, I, I, sure. I have great sympathy for that um, because he's just trying to do the right thing and find information. But anyway, yeah, so we um, got got one of those creepy looking lampshades from a an American um, Holocaust, small Holocaust really museum. And they were absolutely, you know, horrified about this thing. They made a whole plan for what they would do if they found out it was human. And when they found out that it wasn't human, they were so relieved, just beyond. And, and I was so happy that we were able to give that to them. You know, uh, it was a really fraught moment there while we waited for those results. But, you know, people are often, it's not like when people want these tests that they're absolutely like, oh, I really hope it's human skin. <laughs> you know, right, a lot right. of folks are like, I really, really hope it's not. <laughs> well, um, you think a museum would, would say, oh, this is a cool thing for a collection, but it, it's more probably a sense of responsibility. Like if we, if it is human, we have to do something with it but yeah you really don't want to go bad. there yeah it could be really bad pr and then you have to make a decision about sure. what you're thinking. oh sure do you display it yeah so some of these folks um end up it's it's really interesting to me and i try to get across the, <laughs> the whole book about how different institutions can have di completely different opinions about the books and how they should be treated and and stuff like that um, but a lot of the places where I say, you know, the number has stayed the same in public institutions for a while. And one reason, of course, is the pandemic. It's not people's number one priority, <laughs> like getting back from pandemic, let's go test our human skin books. But also, it's like the people who wanted it tend to have tested it already. And the people where it is politically unviable to do so because they don't want to know the truth, they would rather not know than have the truth and have to deal with it if it is human, then I don't think we're ever going to get to test those, right? Like that's just sort of, I think we hit, you can hit a wall with institutional like interest in doing, yeah. doing that. Um, yeah, but like, we've had many places where they're just thrilled to have a negative. Um, and for us at, I was not at UCLA when we tested our book, um, but I was part of the testing like process for that book. And I love that book now. It is not human skin, um, but I love it. 
and I love using it for teaching because that book is like full of lies, right? <laughs> like the book is, there's so much lying on the physical what? object of this book. I'm sorry, what book is this? Did it I is miss a book something? about like the movements of like, it, it's something about movements of a certain city or something in Venice or something like that. Oh, wow. And it has this long provenance about all the libraries it was in and all these things. And then it's bound in human skin and it's written in all these languages. So there are all these handwritten oh. notes over time, which is usually the way you would get this information that is telling you, this is human skin, this is human skin. Then it got put into a box by the library that on the outside, it says human skin binding because people would probably be looking for it. You know, oh, I want to pull this out to, you know, teach with or whatever. And it very helpfully had the little human skin binding. And now it's not, right? <laughs> so all of the things that people put on the object, all of the people who interacted with it over the years did their level best to add context and truth to it. And then this new scientific context completely subverted all of it. So on the online catalog, it says we tested this book and it's not human skin. It was originally believed to be so. But if you just randomly for you wouldn't because, of course, it's restricted. But if you randomly came across that on the sacks and said, hey, there's that human skin book, <laughs> nothing would tell you that it wasn't. So why how did it do you have any idea how that started, the idea that it was human skin? And why would somebody say that if it's not? I mean, you know, I, there are a few books where it's individual book by book. There are a few books where you feel like you can have a little bit of insight into someone's mindset of, you know, the Notre Dame book, for instance, which is not human. Uh, the one owner who is a real piece of work uh, really did horrible things to this book like you know it's a 15th century pig skin uh, alum todd pig skin giant book and he pasted a newspaper article in the center cover just how dare you right and then he put all of these things on the inside and notes about you know how a human skin how much a human skin book went for at auction and things like that and he also tried to tie famous people to the book like Chris, Christopher Columbus and I've seen that as a big red flag that when people try to yeah. tie famous people into the story then they're probably trying to tell you some sort of story um so so I feel like that owner in particular was attempting to deceive with with this story but I think for the most part it's probably just different you know caretakers of a book at different times believe for whatever reason someone told them that this was bound in human skin and they write a little note in it in order to remember oh this is that one because you can't tell by looking at it and then why would you not believe that if you found it <laughs> in a book and right. only in 2015 do we have any way of actually finding out for real. And that was what was so exciting about doing this work because really finding something out that wasn't findable before. So we do know that obviously this is, there are books bound in human skin. I mean, this is a real thing, uh, even if it sounds like uh, more than, more than, more are fake than real. But do you have a sense, looking back, how many books were created this way? Um, I don't really think there's a way to know the full universe of it. Um, and, you know, I also was, I, I wrote story, I wrote the book and picked out certain titles to talk about certain objects like specific books because of their stories or their physicality or something about them that I felt like gave insight into the universe but if someone comes back to me and says oh I have this human skin book bound in a yakuza tattoo like from Japan in the 20th century I'm not going to say that's impossible because it doesn't fit within my framework it's just 
you know, what I was able to find at the time and the context in which the vast majority of those books existed were 19th century Western and some doctor involved somewhere. That's usually- Usually like, a doctor, yeah. Yeah, it's usually that context. But there can always be some context that I'm not aware of. So I'm pretty open-minded about the like universe of how many exist. One thing I say in the book, which I de deeply believe to be true and have had a uh, uh, reason, further reason to believe is true, is that I think there are a lot more in France than an initially known about and that they're in private collections and they're going to stay in private collections because in France, the laws around human body parts and I mean, a lot of their human tissue laws are incredibly strict compared to other countries. So in France, you can't do like a surrogacy pregnancy. You know, like that is something that in America you would think was no big deal, but they have this... Uh -huh statutes about the inviolability of like the human body so the ways that legally they slice and dice what's available like what's okay or not okay in a museum in England versus Scotland versus France versus America are all different um and everyone of course thinks that they're right <laughs> but in France it's like highly illegal to own a human skin book uh you if if someone reports you you will get in trouble uh that's oh. not really the case in most other countries so i really do think that there are a lot more they can't sell them either in france so you see books out of france being sold in other countries and stuff like that it's it's complicated so the their legality around these things too i found really fascinating um but so i, I want to get i want to get into that uh, a little bit the the whole museum and display of human remains and uh, some of the, the ethical questions there. But I, I think the big question I want to make sure I ask is, why did people do this? You know, if I had that, if I had a, a journal from a human skin creating <laughs> doctor, my life would be so much easier. Um, but I do have a theory <laughs> for why it was doctors doing this, um, which was really about, you know, the development of clinical medicine at the time and um, the kind of side effects of the new way of doing medical training and education at the time and the opportunity of being people who dissected bodies frequently. And there were a lot of social things that we now hold so dear that we can't imagine what it was like without them. Like the idea of bodily consent did not exist. Um, it just didn't. Uh, and so that is something it's really hard for people in the 21st century to understand that there were times where it was like, and the doctors got your body and if you were poor or you were an executed prisoner or whatever, and they dissected you to learn medicine because this is better than just, um, it's better to learn scientifically from a dead body and how organs work to help living patients than just, you know, passing down things from your, your doctor, you know, the person you apprenticed with and not doing any sort of science or evidence-based you know, medicine, but then, you know, they would dissect you and when they were done, they would throw you in the trash, you know, um, and that's what happened. And, you know, that was the reality. Did everyone have a working knowledge of what happened in a 19th century anatomy lab? No, probably not. Would they, would you be actually would you be horrified to find out one of your that happened to one of your family members I'm sure you personally would but was there any sort of public outcry or you know laws that were then put in place in order to stop this not really uh and so it was an extremely different time in that way and power structures were in play and all of these things but the sort of um, Michel Foucault called it the clinical gaze was like the idea that I really was like, oh, now I can 
really understand, you know, how, how someone could get into the mindset where it's, oh, where they're not like completely appalled at doing, at physically doing this, right? And so the idea was that the clinic, clinical medicine was a good in scientific terms because you were seeing a lot more patients in a hospital, you were learning scientifically uh, at you know the bedside and via corpses, but the uh, like constant sort of exposure to many, many bodies and not having a personal doctor relationship with these patients, you know, used to just have, oh, I work with this family and you know all of them and you delivered all the babies and stuff like that. That's a lot more of a personal relationship than bed to bed to bed or like corpse to corpse. And what happens if you don't check in with your like humanity that you are dealing with human beings is very easy to quickly dehumanize the people that you're working with. And what's the worst that can happen? This is kind of an evidence of what's the worst that can happen when you allow yourself to get desensitized in that way. Um, and so I really think that that was like a mindset thing, but then also it was doctors were rising in esteem in society, you know, and they were, um, their leadership was, were encouraging gentlemanly pursuits like collecting art and especially collecting books. Um, and so you've got this acquisitiveness and the value of book as an object and the access to a material, a binding material that no one else has access to that then makes your right. book the most special and rare and whatever. And let me show you my little treasure kind of thing. And I think that all of those things I played in into the creation of these books. And again, you know, now people have these ideas of doctors being, you know, these paragons of ethics, et cetera, et cetera. And then this really flies in the face of that, you know, perception. Mm -hmm. uh, but it definitely happened and it happened right. a lot. It wasn't one creepy, you know, it wasn't a, uh, Silence of the Lambs, you know, it was all respected <laughs> doctors in the field, you know, bastions of, of the field. Um, and right. that's the thing that we have to like reckon with in the history of medicine. Right. And I, well, I mean, I read, I read fiction and, and probably I can't remember if I've read anything nonfiction about the practice, but you know, sort of this idea that, oh, it's a cold night in London, we're going to get a lot of bodies brought in, they give, you know, a shilling or I don't know what amount for uh, people to collect bodies and bring them in and they're happy and they say, oh, we've got a child this time, hooray, you know, and it's because, and the the thinking is not, I mean, that, that does sound horrible, but it's also every time they do that, they're able to learn a little bit more about human anatomy and the, and the, and the conditions that, that cause um, disease and, and, and these issues. So, and, and, it, and it's people who there's no personal connection to. And the assumption is that they're people who have no connections now, which is almost certainly false, but you know, it's somebody off the street, they've got no family, they've got no connection. Yeah. They, um, they used a phrase in England for that, uh, which really struck me and they used it in the legislation and stuff when they started addressing things like grave robbing, et cetera. They called them the friendless poor. Mm. Um, and it's like, wow, that is, you know, that's really showing your perspective about, you know, how you are addressing the people that are going to be on the anatomy slab. And part of that reason why it would you used to only be able to get executed prisoners. Well, there were, aren't that many executed prisoners compared to how many medical students there were all of a sudden, right? Um, and so they wanted to expand the pool, but they really wanted to stop medical students and the people they hire robbing graves of rich people. So they were able to say, well, what if we just gave you all the friendless poor? The poor. Yeah. Um, and were these people actually friendless? Probably not. But could their families pay 
to get their bodies back and then have them properly buried also probably not right so it's not necessarily that these people had no connections but they did not have the resources to do like to pay to get a body back and to like pay for their appropriate burial so uh we we, we do if you have any questions uh for megan please uh put them in the chat and we'll We'll try to get to all the questions from the room. And I think we do have one great question right up now. We do. This is actually a perfect segue. David, if you want to unmute and ask your question, please do. Uh, thanks. Um, uh, many, many years ago, I worked for a rare book library at Harvard, probably not the one you were talking to. Um, uh, I what, Before you started talking about the use of medical cadaver skins and uh, it, uh, my my guess had been that that skin used for book binding if there was any uh was from either from enslaved people or from savages or someone who for whatever reason their bodily integrity wasn't honored by the people in charge did you find when you found actual human skin book binding uh, any of that or was it almost all from the medical side I, I braced myself that I would find this and we did not find it. So that was, um, I do have a chapter in the book that deals with like racial relations. And I will say that our test cannot tell anything about a racial background of a person, but also DNA can't tell you that either, which is like a big misperception about DNA. Um, but for, so what we know is that definitely um, black people in America are overrepresented on the anatomist lab. So that is true. We know that, but we can't tell any individual story about an individual book, unless it was like written in the book, we needed them to provide that context to us to say, this was bound in the skin of a woman of a whatever thus far every object that we tested that said it that mentioned a race of a person turned out not to be human skin at all so this is bound the skin of a you know you know the former word for black person or whatever not, so it, it was i found it really interesting and like so did is the deception one of the things that Mark asked me earlier? You know, was this deception um, intentional? You know, does it serve some sort of purpose? And then why is it that only the ones that say the race of someone turn, you know, like why is it every time it says a race of someone that isn't even human at all? Like if you were trying to deceive, why did they add those details? Uh, is something I'll never really uh, obviously get to know, um, but it's a fascinating observation. Um, so, and another thing I wanted to make sure I said is that you cannot tell looking at a piece of leather on a book, what uh, on a human skin book, what the human's skin looked like. Um, when you tan a human skin, it all looks the same. Um, if you've seen, for folks who have maybe the closest current practice that I feel like aligns somewhat with this practice, except adding full consent into the picture, is uh, new methods of tattoo preservation. And it's interesting that if you were a person of color and you preserved your tattoo, the pres preserved tattoo looks like it's on white skin. Um, it does not retain because the melanin is only on the very top layer and the preservation is underneath so there's no way to tell the race of the person based off of this preserved skin and you can dye human skin the same way you can dye any other leather you can do all sorts of different you know things to it the way you could to any other book leather so there's no way of looking at it and saying oh that's the skin of a black person um because it's black like that it, you know it's not it doesn't line up but I fully was like holding my breath waiting for it to uncover something like that and as of yet we have not actually 
So uh, reserve tattoos is something also brand new to me. I don't think we want to get into that, but that's a interesting topic for, <laughs> for exploration, I suppose. One thing I will say about that just very briefly is that when people when you tell the people, you know, books bound in human skin exist, they're like, Ugh. if you tell tattoo people, would you want to save your tattoo? Yeah. They are not, uh, you know, in my experience, people I've talked to are like, yeah, like I, you know, there's, it's like, I paid a lot for that art. And, like, <laughs> you know, there's, uh, because the difference there, the huge difference is consent. Now, right. does consent make something legal? No. <laughs> but the, the squeamishness about the idea in a lot of tattoo communities is way lower than people's reaction to the idea of human skin books. So I, I really want to ask you, and I, I'm afraid we're going to run out of time. I really want to ask you about the the, the, the librarian part of your, your title. But I, I have to ask you about, I think we need to get into this a little bit, um, the, the whole consent issue. Now, re reading this it reminded me of Rebecca Sklut's book, The Immortal Life of Harriet Alax, where her cells are preserved without her knowledge, whether her family's knowledge or consent. Uh, and this is in the 20th century, and, uh, and they're still in use today. Um, and and we, we talked a little bit about the different different countries and different museums and libraries approaches to uh, to having this sort of thing even in existence on display. Um, our, our attitudes are changing. There's a question at the end of this somewhere. I'm sure you can guess where I'm going, but it, it's, I mean, what do, what do we make of this uh, idea that these books even exist? Are they, um, should we be not preserving them, burying them and saying these, that, you know, let's respect the dead? Or are we, is that sort of a, a squeamish 21st century attitude that isn't really necessary? I think um, I try hard in the book to give space to a lot of people's different differing opinions about what is the right thing to do about these books. Um, and, but I will say, along with a lot of things that if you attempt to paint everything with a broad brush, um, you're going to miss some nuance and you're going to make some mistakes. And so I feel like uh, individual cases and what you can know and not know make a huge difference. Um, personally, I do not advocate for the destruction of human skin books because evidence of atrocities is still evidence. And if you are treating, you know, people didn't make them like the people the people who are stewarding the object did not make them they did not do this thing to these people they can treat it with respect and make it available to researchers who are doing research and people some people are like well it has no historical research value well i mean i kind of disagree cuz i spent a couple of years writing a book about it <laughs> and and you know for those books like at harvard he mentioned harvard there were three books that were allegedly human skin. One of them was real, but two of them were not. So are you going to throw out the 1600, uh, 1604 uh, Ovid's Metamorphosis that, because you think it's bound in human skin, but you didn't know that it wasn't? Um, and so then you just destroyed a early modern book for no reason. Um, what if a new method comes along later that can tell us even more? Right. Um, what you can do is use a very memorable object to teach about very difficult ideas of medical consent and his medical history and cultural, uh, you know, and material culture and ethics and library stewardship and all of those things in something that will really like stick with people <laughs> that they'll really remember encountering this thing. Right. Um, and so I think that I personally come down on the side of respectful like preservation of objects um, that are made from human remains. And, uh, and it sounds like also displaying them in, in, a, in a respectful way. Yeah, in 
an appropriate way, you know. Um, so some folks, a lot of places will kind of go on the side of, well, okay, so we know we have this, we can provide and teach context to it, uh, but we don't put it on public display, but it's there for researchers. And in, one, in some cases, you know, I agree with that and I think it's great. And in other cases, well, I would have never even heard about this if that had been the case at the Mooder, right? Like if that wasn't on display publicly, I would have never even learned about any of this and honestly might not have gotten interested in the history of medicine and how it relates to books, right? Um, so I know that is a very specific case, but you never know and I don't think that the Mooder was displaying the books in a tawdry fashion. Um, and, but also, yeah, adding more context to, to everything, you know, the, mm -hmm. this is what we know about how it was created. This is why, this is the context in which it was made. Like all of those things are educational. Um, so yeah, I mean, book by book, book by book decisions yeah. can be made. So you were, um, you said you were uh, interested in uh, antique books and old books before you uh, developed this interest, but you, you also went into becoming a medical librarian. I wonder, is there a connection there? Well, uh, it's funny, you know, sometimes you make choices and you don't really know where they're going to lead. Uh, <laughs> and one of those was that I was going to library school and at the time there was no pathway for distance learning librarians to to get into special collections i tried it just you know wasn't mm -hmm. didn't really work but i knew i wanted to move to los angeles and i had been working at a medical publisher that was also helping with my tuition for library school so i was getting medical background in it in a medical publishing way. And so when I was applying for jobs, I, the medical library was the place that I was successful in getting the job. And I was dealing with medical collections and we had a cool medical rare book collection that no one had paid that close attention to for a while. So I made it my business to learn about the collection. And that was how I started really learning about history of medicine. It was a kind of on my feet, right? Um, learning about the books in my collection so that I could help teach with them and, you know, take care of them. And then some, a lot of these issues around body snatching and, you know, sourcing of bodies for anatomical learning and all of these things, which were well-established history that I thought that the average person didn't really know about but was seen as necessary for us to get to a place, you know, to advance medical knowledge. I thought that that kind of juxtaposition was super interesting. And I thought it was also interesting that we sort of don't talk, didn't talk about it, right? It just wasn't something that was talked about that often. Now, I think that's different now, but when I started, it was like a lot more kind of hush hush feeling. Um, and so that was really, like spark the interest, you know, I got interested in history of medicine because those were the rare books that I had. So then I learned all about the doctors and the things that happened. And uh, so my job at UCLA, which I started in pandemic in 2020 is my first non-medical job, my first non-medical library job. So I've been teaching, you know, health sciences students and, you know, helping researchers for my whole career before now. And now I'm doing more broad academic library stuff. Uh oh, so yeah, so what is your job? Tell us about your day job now. So I work at uh, UCLA Library, which is an amazing place. Uh, it's so big <laughs> and it's part of an even bigger, you know, institution that is the University of California. And so collection strategy as librarian is basically I deal with any kind of collections issue that comes up collections management or sort of strategic like policies and things like that, where it doesn't solely live in one, you know, kind of department, but crosses over a lot of departments or big 
problems that have persisted for a long time that need special attention or big initiatives like anti-racism in library collecting is something that I'm really involved in and um, kind of a team lead in, in that area. So it's very kind of project-based and ongoing sort of looking big picture. We're extremely active in open access um, and doing things in open access publishing for UC uh, authors that isn't hasn't really been done by other places in the United States. So we're really kind of forging new roads to open access that didn't um, exist before in this country. Uh, and so- Are, are, we, ta are we talking about, yeah, I'm sorry. Are we talking about uh, um, uh, professional journals? In terms of articles, yeah. So the journal is the is a method where we have had the most traction, but uh, we've been doing a method called uh, transformative agreements, which is a particular reaction to the American capitalist scholarly publishing landscape, where <laughs> the big publishers are the ones that control. So a university pays a researcher. The researcher gives the journal their research for free and then they make the university pay them to read it right. <laughs> um and at some point someone said hey wait a second <laughs> you know maybe maybe there's a better way um and so one of the ways that we've been active in this is creating new pathways with the publishers where instead of paying them for access to the stuff that we gave them for free, that we are paying for their open access publishing services. So our, our researchers can publish with the journals that they see as prestigious and important, but then the result is an article that's free for anyone in the world to read. That's a fascinating topic in itself. Um... It's, and it's not just, I mean, as a, a collections person, a library, I, I mean, I, I suppose we all still naturally go to the thinking of, you know, what books are we going to buy? Um, are, are we seeing a, a movement away from books in libraries, especially in academic libraries? No, uh, I think different disciplines have their favorite modes. You know, the humanities is extremely still like book centric and they really do like the physical object a lot. The sciences are way more, you know, journal article specific, less, they care less about the physical format book. You know, it's all kind of different um, depending on what you want. Uh, primary sources like archives and things like that are super duper important for researchers and a huge focus of um library collecting not only the physical we're collecting this physical archive but also we are buying access to a database of someone else's scanned copies of these you know are you know things that you would normally have to have the wherewithal to travel to that place to do the research while well, now it's available in this database and the library can provide that for you and then you can yeah. access that for your paper or something like that so it really uh it really depends on um but our library our physical buildings are always full they are really really full of books and you know <laughs> it's always a, a challenge to make sure they don't get over full um so the i don't see uh the demise of the book has been greatly exaggerated um <laughs> i also feel that the younger generation of college students coming in have are really reading physical books. They're buying physical books, they're reading physical books. Um, they might not use them as much for the research, but they are absolutely readers and um, and tend to like to read not on a screen because they're on a screen all the time. Yeah, makes sense. So you uh, you had a um, uh, uh, appreciation for old books. Do you own any books in particular that you're proud of? Do I own any? I think I'm kind of 
banking on the rare or special book of the future, um, <laughs> which is a <laughs> way that you can do, you can do it with a librarian budget, um, which is collect things that are happening at the time and then get old and wait. <laughs> so cool. yeah. I have a collection, I have a very robust collection of signed books of the authors of the death positive movement who have many who have gone on to great things, um, you know, that maybe my daughter will be like, hey, look at my collection yeah. <laughs> of first generation death positive author signed copies, um, bespoke, you know, artwork sent to me by the artists of the movement, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, I have plenty of those things. And maybe one day someone will think that they're worth something. Excellent. And well, and and you're and that's something we um maybe should talk about. You're in, you're involved in that uh uh death salons, is that um is that the right term? Um tell us we only have a couple of minutes, but tell us briefly about that. Is this an outgrowth of of your in, of the um anthropomorphic um bound books or is it come up come about differently uh you know it, it it came about separately but i think my interest in uh my interest in the history of medicine stuff and the way corpses were used sort of had me meet folks who were doing works work in the very early stages of death positivity as it's now known so you know me meeting caitlin doty you know there was a very uh this is a weird reference but there was a very 24-hour party people moment of like that there was this one <laughs> uh sex pistol show that everyone no one was at the show but everyone in the crowd ended up making some of the most important bands of the 80s that's pretty much what happened at this one event in Los Angeles where I met every single person who later became <laughs> you know, the people who who are the biggest authors and artists in death positivity. We all just happened to be in the same place. Um, and so I started working with them on sort of death positivity, which is really the idea. The phrase comes from the idea of sex positivity, where it's about open, honest conversation and um, uh, about death instead of trying to hide it or um, not talk about it that is impolite to talk about or that there's only one acceptable way to do a certain thing. Uh, understanding other cultures and time periods and how culturally specific we are and fostering new especially greener technologies around death. Um, so my librarian skills came in handy as a sort of curator of putting together public events of the people doing work in all of so many different areas that relate to this. And those were the death salons that we were doing. And we did events around the country, uh, around the world actually um, for a few years there and then we took a break right before pandemic and we have not come back. Uh, I don't know if it's going to come back in that form. Uh, we were sort of preaching to the choir at that point, I felt like, uh, where people mm. would use their annual vacation to come, you know, to the city where we were doing it instead of helping educate people who were in local to the city. We had our like diehard fans and we love those. Right. But it, it would take a whole year to plan an event for right. the same group and I think there are a lot of other ways to spread the the message and um people have really been doing that I mean the order of the good death which was like death salon was the uh event arm of the nonprofit. you know they put out full documentaries on uh, on YouTube um they have gotten legislation passed in many states for new greener um disposition methods I mean you know, the work continues. Um, and it, it's, it's, I'm an honor to be part of it and be a supporter and help out where I can. Um, even if I'm not like actively doing the events and stuff like yeah. that. All right. So, uh, dark archives is the book. Is it doing, doing pretty well? Yeah, yeah, they just off every spooky season to talk about it. <laughs> you oh. know, 
um, people will, will get interested again and I get tagged a lot. Uh, and it's found its readers despite the pandemic, you know, yeah. mess of publishing. It's found its readers and they reach out and that feels really nice. Yeah, excellent. All right, well, it's been wonderful to have you uh, for the hour. It's very interesting. Thank you so much. We finally got a librarian on the show, which is definitely something lacking. Um, Thank you, Erin uh, Brenner. She she filled in for Sarini today. Sarini couldn't make it uh, doing our live posting. Um, so it's good to have an old friend back uh, on the show. And speaking of old friends, uh, next month we've got Minyan Fogarty, uh, Grammar Girl. Um, her book, uh, the, the Grammar Devotional, is being reissued with a new title and uh some new stuff and so we're going to talk to her next month about that um so yeah thank you very much and we'll see you again next time Thanks so much, everybody.